When I was 15 years old, I spent the weekend at my synagogue for a winter conclave with about 200 other 15 to 17 year old kids. And the big event of the weekend was the hypnotist. Now, I don't know if any of you out there have ever been to a hypnotist show, but they are all the same. They have the chairs on the stage, they ask for volunteers, you go up, you get hypnotized, you are embarrassed, you sit down. Show is great. <laughs> 15 years old, I raised my hand, I'll go up on the stage. I went up. I remember sitting in the metal chair, listening to the instructions of the hypnotist. He was explaining how he's going to relax you. Shut your eyes, listen to his voice, pretty soon you will go to sleep, and then you'll be hypnotized. And when I opened my eyes back up again, I looked around, and I was the only chair left on the stage. All nine, under, nine other chairs were gone. My mom, my parents were chaperoning the event, totally different story. My mom was standing next to me with tears in her eyes, and 200 kids were applauding wildly at what looked like the best show they've ever seen. I very quickly came to realize I was the show. Um, I went so far under this hypnotist said to the other kids, get off the stage, we got a live one here. <laughs> I clucked like a chicken. I took the microphone, I had to develop my own language and sing a Michael um, uh, a Wham song, if for, for those that are the 80s uh, folks out there. In my, you know, totally took the stage over. I even did a little regression analysis. They brought me back to when I was four years old, which is the reason why my mom was on stage in tears, because to her, I was that four-year-old little girl to her. It was wild. I remember nothing of it. I just remember I felt really out of it when I woke up and thought, ooh, I don't think I ever want to do that again. Now I'm 17. My sister is at her first year in college, and I went up to spend the weekend with her. My sister was so excited to show me her new friends, the college scene up in Boston, and to go to the big event of the weekend, the hypnotist show. <laughs> I was so pissed off at her. Are you kidding me? I am not going to be the entertainment. She says, don't even worry about it. It's in an arena that sits like 800 seats. It's actually almost exactly like the theater we're in now. And my sister got seats third row from the back. So when you do in the third row, You'll understand as I say this. I said, all right, I'll go. So we go, 10 seats on the stage. She picks the volunteers. They sit up on the stage. I'm in the third row. I'm listening just like everybody else. And he's relaxing everybody. He's explaining how he's going to put you under. And he takes out a harmonica. His thing was, he's going to play the harmonica, and then you go out. So I remember listening to him, and I remember hearing, and then I open my eyes, <laughs> and I'm on the floor in the chair in front of me with my legs kind of half cocked up there. My sister is next to me, looking like I'm a freak of nature. And the row that's in front of me, if they could have unbolted their seats, turned them around to look at me, they would have, because they had the best seat in the house in the back. Because 10 people hypnotized on stage, and Melissa in the 11th row in the back, picking my hair, everybody smelled around me, you know, I was totally out. My sister was so afraid she was going to send me back home to Jersey, I'd see a hobo with a harmonica <laughs> and freeze, because you always see those. Um, so we waited for the uh, hypnotist, and, uh, you know, we told him what happened. He asked me a couple questions, and this is what he said. He said, Melissa, you need to understand something. You have zero inhibitions. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing that is off limits to you. You will approach everything in your life, and you do approach everything in your life, all in. There's nothing you won't do. There's nothing you won't say. You are all in the minutes of your life. I mean, you are what us hypnotists dream about. If you don't want to be hypnotized, don't even watch it on TV. <laughs> Two things from that day. Number one, I have never been hypnotized, willingly. 
and I've never watched it on TV. And number two, at 17 years old, I realized I had some type of, I don't know, superpower about myself. Didn't know how it was going to shape as I got older, but definitely knew something about me. I remember my very first performance review. I was with GE, and my boss, just like every other performance review that you've all had, they've got the paperwork in front of them, he flips over the paperwork before we get started. He says, Melissa, before we get started in the conversation, I want to tell you something. You remind me of my dog. I know what you're thinking, because you're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. I'll just pack my shit and get out of here. <laughs> I'm done. But he very quickly said, please, let me explain. I'm a pet owner. I don't know if you're a pet owner, but I'm a pet owner. When I come home from work, my dog comes running up to me, and I'm telling you, that dog, it's all about me in that moment. I mean, the dog's not focused on the moment that passed. It's in the now. I'm rubbing his belly. We're talking. Oh my God, it's so good to see you. And that dog is just, oh, I'm all about you. And when the moment's over and he goes on to eat or the bone, that's the next moment the dog is really into. Melissa, when you come into a situation, a problem, anything, you can see you are full in. You are so in that minute, that moment, and there's nothing that's off limits. You say what you see, you're in it. When I think about that, and as I thought about that experience for this talk, you know, he's right. He's absolutely right. I don't look at my life, I think, the way people typically do. I don't look at my life in compartments. So there isn't my friends, my work, my, my home, my family. It's just life. No matter who I'm with, it doesn't matter how high in the food chain it is. It doesn't matter if it's somebody that's given me my Starbucks coffee. I'm me no matter where I am. And I say what I see when I'm me, no matter where I am. Now, that doesn't mean I just kind of walk up to, you know, who knows, man, that shirt is awful. You know, it's, it's not like that. You have to build relationships. And I take a lot of pride in building really strong relationships what I refer to as breaking bread. Meaning, when I approach a person to get to know them, I'm not asking surface questions. So I don't, I don't really, you know, five years, how long have you been in J&J? &J? Five years, 10 years, oh, that's very nice. Oh, what do you want to do? Oh, you're looking to be a manager one day? Oh, that's very nice. That's very nice. Oh, really, you went to school, you lived in the suburb? Oh, that's nice. That's not really knowing somebody. I want to know, when you went to college, what was your major? And if you didn't do it, why? What really pisses you off? When you're on vacation, what is it that you really want to do? Because while I'm having that discussion, and I, again, I am full in, that conversation with that individual, I'm nowhere but there in that minute. Because I'm thinking through the answers and finding the connection between me and the person in front of me. There's always a connection. There's always a connection, which really allows me to sort of say what I see and just be as radically real as I am standing here in front of you. In 2010, I was diagnosed with cancer. Really bad cancer. Not like it could be good, but bad cancer. Stage three breast cancer, out of nowhere. And for me, I was 40. My mom had cancer at 40. She was diagnosed. She went on chemotherapy, or she looked like shit, and then she died at 40. So to me, I kind of thought, this is going to be the same book. And as I started my journey with cancer and realized, huh, things seem to be a little different than with my mom. And I, I'm not so sure the end of my journey, I'm going to die. And I thought, as I do with anything in sort of saying what I see, I thought maybe even something as taboo as cancer, people would be interested to share in my journey. And I put together an email that was titled, Melissa Update. 
And at the time, I only sent it to about 15, 10, 15 people, all walks of life. I was supporting a company group chairman, a couple of vice presidents, my boss, my colleagues. And I basically just started to say what I see in as authentic manner as possible. Raw, embarrassing, humorous, real way. I talked about things like chemotherapy. So I thought chemotherapy, the one silver lining of me getting cancer was I would finally be at my goal weight. I am going to be thin. Well, I gained weight, a lot of weight. Who does that? I gained 20 pounds. Well, I realized weight equals life with chemotherapy. I didn't know that. I thought maybe somebody else would find that interesting. I shared my journey of hair loss, which was the worst day of my life. It still is the day that I lost control when my hair started to fall out and I had to go and get it shaved off. Hair loss that leads to other things that you didn't quite realize were important, like you don't have nose hairs anymore, so shit just falls out of your nose. <laughs> you got no control. I gotta carry one of these. I'm like my grandparent, right? <laughs> I'm only 44 and I'm already... It's ridiculous. By the time that year was done, all the things I had gone through, either people directly asking me, can you put me on these updates that I sent out every other month, or people being forwarded these updates, people were getting these Melissa updates. There was like 100 people on them. And then seven months ago, my cancer came back, stage four. So now it's, it's terminal, there's no cure. Now the oncologists talk in a very soft tone, it's all about your quality of life now. Can you show you have a good quality of life? And I dusted off the email, and again, I was as brutally authentic and real and embarrassed and frightened and humorous as I possibly could to my colleagues, because this time the message was much, a little more serious. I gotta, I gotta contain and shrink this thing, because if I can't contain it and if I can't shrink it, I can't be here. When I finally came back to work, which was only three weeks ago, I, uh, there was about 400 people getting the word, getting these Melissa updates. That's wild. People were inspired by me, just saying what I see about something like cancer. And I thought, is that so unusual? Doesn't everybody say what they say? I, I guess not. I guess not. And it is really so easy to do, to say what you see. I have to tell you, there's so many people in this room. There's 992 seats in this theater. Why they couldn't put an extra eight in here and make it a clear thousand, I have no idea. <laughs> but if all 992 of you go out of this room and do three things, I would be a very happy person. One, go break some bread. Go build some relationships. Don't ask those surface feeding questions. Really get dirty. Get to know people. If you want to try that out, come break some bread with me. I would love it. I would love it. Two, say what you see. If you're sitting in a meeting, if you're just with a colleague, if you're with your boss, if you're with your kids, say what you see. Because when you say what you see, other people, it's like liberating to them they kind of take it and they start saying what they see too, honestly. And lastly, most importantly, just be you. Be radically real, be embarrassing, be funny, be authentic, be you. You have one life. And who knows how long it's gonna be for. I am living proof of that. Thank you. <laughs>